Mithras, an enigmatic and influential god, looms large in the religious landscape of both the Roman and Persian realms. While some aspect of Mithras' worship differ in each culture, his enduring appeal lies in the mysterious and multifaced nature of his character. The Persian Meher is described in the Avesta as the heavenly god, as the good, foremost, merciful, and the mighty strong warrior. He was considered the most powerful force against the lord of the demons, Angramanyu, who feared his mace more than any other of the gods' weapons. The inscription of Hashayarsha II lists Ahura Mazda, Anahit, and Meher invoking their protection of his building projects, which has encouraged scholars in the past to conclude that Zoroastrianism either was polytheistic or henotheistic at best. Mithras would have been worshipped like any other gods at outdoor fiery temples, where the elements of fire, air, earth, and water were honored. Worship of Mithra, or at least widespread veneration of the god as an avatar, must have continued because it was practiced by the Kilikian pirates. It is probable that Kilikian pirates, who are said to have practiced some form of Mithras worship by the Plutarch, inspired the movement which would become the popular cult of the Mithras in Rome. The adherents themselves wrote nothing down because they were initiates in the mystery cult, meaning a closed religious group who kept their belief and rituals in a secret and were not interested or even allowed to share information with the non-initiates. Mithras is universally depicted in art as a young man slaying the celestial bull in an act interpreted as the symbolizing death and the rebirth. Based on archaeological evidence and early Christian criticism of the cult, Mithraism was astrological in nature, focusing on divination and the rebirth after death. Initiates went through a number of trials which, once passed, elevated the adherent upper hierarchy of the seven grades, corresponding to the seven celestial heavens, until they reached the highest one, that of the father, who was regarded as an enlightened and protective priest figure. Mithras was also adopted by the Parthian Manichaeans into their respective pantheon as the third messenger, one of the emanation and subsequently father of Jesus Redeemer. But did this enigmatic deity, with his manifestation in both Roman and Persian realms, extended his influence to the ancient Arabs as well? The most compelling clue indicating the potential presence of Mithraism among the ancient Arab tribes lies in the historical prominence of Roman soldiers in the region. Mithraism was notably popular among the Roman warrior aristocracy. A Roman military campaigns and garrisons reached far-flung territories, including parts of the Arabian Peninsula. It is plausible the worship of Mithras may have been introduced by these soldiers to the local tribes. The recent discovery of three previously unidentified Roman fortified camps across the northern Arabia, made by the University of Oxford School of Archaeology through the satellite imagery, provides intriguing evidence of a potential Roman military presence in the region. Archaeologists have reason to believe these camps were constructed by the Roman army. No excavation have yet been carried out on the site. The important place of pilgrimage of Arabs in the 2nd century was the village of Si, which is located about 3 kilometers southeast of the Qanawat, a city of Decapolis. The site was home to a sanctuary of Baal Shamin, the storm god, which was constructed between the 1st century BCE to the 2nd century CE and involved the participation of the tribe Abaisat, very well attested in Safaitic and Nabataean inscriptions. Indeed, a man of the Abaisat tribe called upon the Baal Shamin in the Safaitic inscription for security as he participated in the rebellion against the Romans. The architecture and sculpture decorations reveal local tradition increasingly marked by the Roman influence. Two reliefs of Mithras were recovered from the site and are now housed at the Damascus Museum. Mithras slaying bull in usual attire and the Phrygian cap. Another important source for physical evidence of Mithraic rites among the Arabs is in ancient Syria. 
Several Mithraic monuments and Mithraeums have been discovered in different cities of the ancient Syria, including the Dura Europas, Dalicus, Caesarea Maritima, Sidon, and Hawarte. These monuments and sites provide evidence for the presence of Mithraism in Syria and its connection to the Roman Empire. The Syrian Mithraic monuments generally follow the norms and motives known for the western provinces of the Roman Empire. Considering the presence of the Mithraic rites in the Syria, it is possible that the Arab population which was inhabiting this region since the 9th century BC could have been part of these mysteries. The Arabs mentioned in Syria by Greco-Roman writers were assimilated into Greco-Aramean culture that dominated the region and the text they produced were written in Greek and Aramaic. Old Arabic was not used for writing purposes, but most likely used as a vernacular. While the archaeological record suggests a decline in the construction and repair of Mithraea from the early 5th century, the worship of Mithras in at least some locations may have continued. What form this took is impossible to discern. However, it is not difficult to imagine that as one generation moved to the next, these sculptural fragments now far removed from their original context would enter a new stage of their cultural biography. Just as sculptures can be refashioned or misidentified, so too many these last remnants of the Mithras cults have taken on new names and meanings before being completely forgotten. The Mithraic cosmology highlights the harmony and tension between the celestial forces represented by Mithras and the planets. Each of the seven grades was associated with one of the seven planets, and the cold life revolved around the symbolism of the elements and climes of the universe. Mithras, as unconquered sun, symbolizes the eternal and unchanging aspect of the universe whilst the planets represent the ever-changing and cyclical nature of time. This contrast between the divine and temporal is a central theme in Mithraism, emphasizing the complex interplay between the cosmic forces and the human existence. The Mithraic symbol on a ladder with the seven gates and the eighth gate on the top represented the celestial revolutions and the journey of souls. The Mithraeum, designed as an image of the universe, was a valid representation of the place where the descent and return of souls took place. According to David Olenzi, the professor of philosophy and religion at the California Institute of Integral Studies, the Mithraic mysteries were inspired by the discovery, or rather rediscovery, of the procession of the equinoxes by Hipparchus in the 2nd century BC. Yulanzi argues that Mithras originated as the personification of the force responsible for the procession, which led to the belief in the two sons in the Mithraic ideology. Mithras, as the hypercosmic entity, became associated with the hypercosmic sun, representing the power beyond the cosmos. The belief in two sons was not unique to the Mithras as it was also found in Platonic and Pythagorean circles, which goes way back to the Empedocles. Of particular interest is the report made by the Stabes in his Eclogues about the Pythagorean belief that light of hypercosmic sun is the reflected mirrored one, which seems to be the same reasoning we're witnessing in the famous verse of the light in the Quran. In the writings of the priest Origen, who cites the atheist writer Celsus, the connection of concept of hypercosmic sun to Mithras become evident. According to Celsus, Mithras' role in celestial immortality was a Mithraic doctrine which involved two symbols of the celestial circuit. One symbol represented the fixed stars, whilst the other symbol represented the ecliptic region, with the souls passing between these two. This circuit was believed to include a ladder with the seven gates, leading to the eighth gate, where the Mithra seat was situated. Porphyry, a Neoplatonist philosopher from the 3rd century, similarly ascribed this belief to Mithra's worshippers, describing Mithras as the lord of creation and the controller of these two celestial orbits within the region of the celestial equator. Franz Cumont, 
who was a notable archaeologist and historian, a researcher who studied the image of Tauroctony, proposed that it was a Roman interpretation of the myth of the attack on the primeval cow of the Gavaya Vedata in the Zoroastrian tradition. According to Cuman, the main similarity between Tauroctony and Iranian mythology is that the killing of a cow represents the act of creation and the forces of the good. The dog embodies these forces of good, while snakes and scorpions represent the forces of the evil. They fight for the source of the life, which is the blood and semen. Ultimately, the forces of the good prevails, symbolized by the sprouting of wheat ears from the tail of the sacrificed cow. And according to the Bundahishn, the Zoroastrian creation myth, the cow indeed was attacked. But it wasn't attacked by Mithra, but by the Ahriman itself. Before the attack, the Harmist fed the cow with a curative substance to reduce its destruction and restlessness. I myself personally doubt human interpretation of animals in this scene, even though the idea itself is not, as many of the Cumans critics try to characterize it, something monstrously amateurish, as the division of the animal world into the demonic and divine is an obvious fact in the Zoroastrian literature, which is most likely also reflected in the Muslim Hadith corpus, where Muhammad, all of a sudden just like Zoroastrian priest, had some problems with the reptiles. Despite all of that, snake on Tauroctony scene is often depicted with his dining companion, the dog, licking blood of the bull in a friendly way. However, there is no doubt for me that the Zoroastrian myth was the basis for the Mithraic one. Scene was indeed taken from Iranian mythology. However, for some reason, most scholars assume that it is impossible as the Ahriman is the perpetrator in the Iranian myth. And that assumption, I think, is absolutely unwarranted. The identification of the Mithras with the Ahriman might indeed seem something astonishingly horrible to the average Iranian. But it must be remembered that we are dealing with a Roman military aristocracy. It is obvious that Arimanization of Mithras would not have been taboo for the Romans. In fact, it would have been politically expedient to do so. It would have been part of the ideological and theological struggle with Rome's de facto main political rivals, the Iranians. The chief god of the cult thus becomes the chief villain of Iranian mythology and collective psyche, the Ahriman. That is indirectly confirmed by the numerous Arimanius statues found in the Mithraic temples. As the human himself points out that from the way the name is used, it seems absolutely implausible that it refers to an evil entity within the cult, no matter how formidable his description might appear. And some inscriptions dedicated to the god Arimanius is indeed found on a few altars to the Mithras himself. Some statues of Arimanius with the same stylistic features, however, presented with a human, not the lion hat. That again shows syncretic nature of the deity and equation of Mithras with the Arimanius himself. Such a long introduction was, I think, absolutely necessary in order to proceed to speculation on the subject of the Quran. Unfortunately, the influence of Mithraism on Islam remains an extremely understudied topic, but I think this topic is bound to bear great promise. As the professor of history at New York City College of Technology, Parvane Pursharyati, points out, the possibility and partially Iranian context of the holy book of Islam, the Quran, is a subject that has been scarcely touched upon, and it is a desiderata worthy of serious examination. An open question remains as to which Mithraism influenced Islam more strongly, Roman or Iranian one. Our surah consists of five brief verses. According to the modern scholars, the text of the surah is perceived as a magical and protective incantation. This surah is thought to form a unity with its following counterpart, and it is believed to possess apotropaic qualities, serving as a safeguard against the evil forces. 
Scholars described it as the conjuring prayer, an exorcism formula, emphasizing its magical and protective attributes. Qul a'udhu bil rabbil falaqa. The initial imperative qul can be taken not as the part of the divine command addressed to the Muhammad, but as an instruction to the reader. Several scholars have noted that in certain cases, this imperative could reflect a liturgical context and that in the specific case of our surah, it would indicate the prayer. Without a doubt, the way the Quran uses this imperative is reminiscent of Egyptian magical texts. The most obvious example of such a text would be the so-called Mithraic Catechism, 4th century papyri from Hermopolis, which many scholars assign being Mithraic in provenance. The document seems to involve questions and answers, and is perhaps a preparatory catechism for an initiation. The question and answer structure demonstrates similarities very clearly. The text of the incantation itself begin with the verb audu, followed by the preposition be, which derives from the triliteral root auth with equivalent in different Semitic languages, including the Biblical Hebrew, where the verb aoz means to seek refuge, like in Isaiah chapter 30 verse 2. In the Quran, this root is used 17 times, seven of which are in the form seen here. Evidence from ancient popular inscriptions found in the Negev suggests that this was a relatively common Arabic formula. Notably, one inscription, dated back to the middle of the 8th century, contains the phrase seeking the paradise and recourse with a god for the shelter. In this inscription, as well as in the opening verses of the surah, the reciter of the incantation seeks refuge with and protection against something or someone. Person seeks refuge with the Rab al-Falaq, translated as the Lord of the Daybreak. Lord of the Dawn. This unique expression combining the Rab, meaning the Lord, with the rare term Falak, derived from the root fa la qaf, connoting to split, to divide, is only found in this verse. Etymologically is most likely stemming from Akkadian pilaku, a wooden handle, possibly a wood chip. The cognates are found in various Semitic languages, including Hebrew, Aramaic, Ge'ez. In Semitic languages, verbal nouns may denote an axe, a soldier, military division, waste, wound, etc. In Greek, analogous word pelekos was used also for single-bladed axe. In another verse where this similar root is used, God is described as the one who splits the sky at the dawn, leading Muslim scholars and Orientalists to analogically associate it with the dawn. Judging that falak is used with a definite article, I assume that we are dealing either with a specific term or adjectival in idafa construction. If we do follow the classical interpretation, the scriptural reference in the Quran to the Lord of the Dawn may indeed be a mark of the memory of Mithraism. Mithras is often associated with the Dawn and he is considered to be the god of the daybreak, the morning deity. This can be traced back to the Vedas, where he is described awakening people at the daybreak. Similar function in the Arabic pantheon played the god Azizos, who was also identified with the morning dawn. In the Avastan text, Mihr is only identified with the light of the daybreak, and not with the sun. This identification is secondary compared to the function of Mihr being the watcher of the contracts, who rises proverbially early which proves the doctrine of the two sons was already in place when Avesta was created. There are also sculptural monuments dedicating to the Mithras where he is depicted holding an axe. This is not a feature of the Mithras, but rather an artistic trend in the Roman Empire. The function of the axe on the sculptures remains unclear. The second verse begins with the enumeration of the harms against which the person reciting the incantation seeks protection by seeking refuge with the Lord of the Dawn. Person asking for the shelter against the evil shar that he has created, ma halaka. This translation interpretation has posed a theological problems for the some Muslim and non-Muslim exegetes who are skeptical about seeking protection from God against the evil created 
by the same God. The root of the verb from which this word is derived remains in question. In Arabic, in all probability, the ancient root was modified and divided into the two subroots, one with a letter ha and another with a soften ha. Translating this verb as to create is just one of the many options, since the primitive verb denotes separation and division. And West Semitic usually denotes the portion, division and the fate. This seems to be the case for the Safaitic too. Such an association is found in the Quran, where the verbal noun is used to indicate the character of the person, which is also reiterated by the Khalil in his first Arabic lexicon. Thus, it is possible to interpret this passage as the evil that is destined to be more precise the evil of fate. I find this interpretation much more appealing, as the structure of the surah itself shows that it is describing specific instances of evil. It would be out of character for such a magical amulet to refer to evil firstly in a general sense, and then secondly to start listing very specific examples of sorcery against which the amulet is directed. The Mithraic cult was known for its strong religious discipline and devotion, which appealed to the pragmatic Romans. In the Mithras liturgy, Mithra is portrayed as a mediator necessary to introduce the initiate to the greatest god, whilst the Helios, the son of the Mithra, appears as the youthful and the radiant figure. It is the father, Mithras himself, who is beyond even the fixed stars. He is depicted as the god who transcends the realm of fate and governs the celestial realm. The concept of the seven planets as fate agency is a central theme in the document. The idea is rooted in the ancient cosmology where the division between reality above and below the moon was significant. The planets are seen as the part of superlunary reality, moving in the perfect order and reflecting the intelligence of God the craftsman mind. The sevenfold nature of heavens above is precisely what the Quran defends. وَمِن شَرِي غَاسِقٍ إِذَا وَقَبْ The verse 3 repeats the plea for protection against the evil, شَر. The sentence includes the two words appealing only once in the Quran, the noun غَاسِق and the second, the verb وَقَبْ. Concerning the first, some interpret it to mean the moon. Some suggest meaning of the darkening based on the another instance of the Quran which uses derivative noun from the same root. Also, possible candidate for etymology is mandaic, where the homologous verb ashik means to oppress and figuratively to blind someone. This semantic pattern fits perfectly in the all instances of this root in the Quran. The second unique word, which is the strict habax, is waqaba. Some suggest it means to arrive or to extend in relation to darkness. It appears to have only one morphological equivalent, with the Hebrew verb yeqeb, to press. Overall, this verse is believed to refer to the fears associated with the night, which can be conductive to the schemes of demons and sorcerers. In the Mithras liturgy, darkness is a significant symbol. It represents the state of ignorance and separation from the divine. The magician and the initiate are in darkness at the beginning of the ritual, signifying their spiritual state before the initiation. Mithras being the hypercosmic sun symbolizes the victory of the sun over the darkness, when the astronomical sun, the Helios, is unable to resist the forces of evil. That is why Mithras is endowed with the title of having a thousand of eyes, for his gaze is not hindered by the darkness. The verse 4 presents a plea for protection against the evil, shar, of those who blow on the knots. The word nafathat refers to the blowers, derived from the triliteral root non fatha, which is an obvious derivation of Arabic root non fa sin, meaning to blow, similar to other Semitic languages. According to Muslim exegetes followed by the modern translators, these blowers in the knots are considered to be the sorceresses, as their action involves a form of sympathetic magic aimed at tying a knot. 
in ancient world, the magical power of knots was a common procedure. Among the Assyrians, knotting and untying were a fundamental expression of magic. In Hebrew, Aramaic, and Ethiopian, the word heber has the meaning of to tie and is taken in a magical sense. Among the ancient Arabs, knots were widely used as the magical practice. Greeks also practiced sorcery involving the knots. For example, in the Greek magical papyri, we can find a charm spell in which the magical knots are used. What is interesting is that the Gnostic divinity Abrasax is evolved for help to charm the lover. In the Avastan hymn to Meher, it is mentioned that Meher is the nemesis of the Pairikas, a class of female demonic beings in the Avesta and often translated as the sorceress, witches, or enchantresses. Some linguists directly link the word to the Roman Parcae, the three Roman goddesses of fate, whose Greek culture counterpart are the Moiras. In the Avesta, Pairikas often appear in the conjunction with the other demonic beings. Mihra is evoked to assist in the struggle against the evil gods, men, sorceresses, and witches. The verse 5 focuses on seeking protection from the evil of the envious person. The noun hasid and the verb hasada both come from the triliteral root ha sin dal, which in Semitic languages means to humiliate or to despise. This root is used only three other times in the Quran and appears to be related to the semantic field of jealousy. According to the Muslim contextualizing interpretation, the envious person here referred to the Jews who cast a spell against the Muhammad at a specific moment in his life. However, another more general and perhaps more accurate understanding is that this verse referred to the evil eye. In the case of the classical antiquity and the late Roman world, the term evil eye as such is hardly used at all. The term which is used mostly by the Greek speakers is the phthonos, and by Latin speakers is invidia. Yeah, the logo of the famous company is for the reason. This belief complex includes the notion that the eye is an active organ capable of projecting harmful energy. It is also encompasses the belief that the possessors of the evil eye, whether humans or demons, can cause serious damage, destruction, and even death. The evil eye is seen as the physical mechanism through which envy and malice flow from the perpetrator to the victim. Roman citizens were deeply superstitious and believed in the destructive power of the evil eye. This belief led them to be cautious about adverse views and to protect themselves against the envy and jealousy of the others. Mosaics depicting the evil eye, such as the mosaic Kai Su in Antioch, were a common sight in the Roman society. But what is striking is the presence of similar animals associated with the evil eye in both the mosaics and the Mithras Tauroctony, which raises the question of a possible connection. Whilst the more or less traditional interpretations focus on celestial symbolism, Considering the superstitious nature of the Roman society suggests that the animals in Mithras Tauroctony may also represent protection against the evil eye. The animals depicted under the sacrificed bull in this relief symbolize Mithras' victory over the bull and his ability to bring fertility and wealth to humanity and the whole animal kingdom, whilst banishing envious and the negative spirits. The lack of differentiation between the animals would again show a twist of the original Iranian myth where such distinction is obvious. This would be a complete rejection of the idea of dividing animals into the demonic and divine ones. In summary, our Sura is an example of magical protective amulet, the formalist basis of which was most likely influenced by the Mithraism, the Lord of the Dawn, acts as an obelisk divinity, providing protection from the evil. The thematic connection of the Sura seems to me to go back specifically to Mithras, and not to localized pre-Islamic Arabic deities, although it worth noting that information on them is extremely scarce.
delving into the concepts like the idea of union with God, the description of God as all-knowing and all-seeing, similar to the Mithra, the symbolism of the sevenfold nature of the heavens, significance of keeping the covenants, a regular structure of some suras can provide a fertile ground for the investigation. Another intriguing suggestion that Mithraism may have foreshadowed Islam lies in its militaristic spirit. Mithraism was a religion that often emphasized the discipline, hierarchy, and loyalty among its followers, forming a strong sense of the brotherhood akin to the military companionship. Similarly, Islam emerged with a strong emphasis on the unity and the concept of jihad, which in some interpretations reflects a certain militaristic ethos. Despite the extinction of Mithraism in the 5th century, the collective memory of Mithraism could have been preserved with the advent of Islam in the 6th century. And with you was the host of the Gnostic Quran channel. If you wish to support the channel, links are in the description box. May your hopes be eternal.